Hello everyone. Welcome to our annual Orphan Expo. My name is Joanne Lutz and along with my colleague Karen Stever, we are both technical representatives for the GGS Pro Department at Griffin. We are happy to present to you today on making biologicals better, easier, and more cost effective. So a quick overview of our presentation. <clears throat> Karen and I have packed what we feel are going to be some new and refresher tips for you to take home to incorporate into your biological programs. I will be presenting on recent innovations and strategies, while Karen will be uh, presenting on environmental safety and support and economics. So what are our recent innovations in biocontrol? Why well, now, having had my own business, a greenhouse operation and consulting, often you don't get a chance to really stay on the top top of what things are going on in the BCA world. But luckily, Griffin has three BCA vendors that we partner with, and they are top notch at what they do in innovation and producing quality product. And to some of you in the audience that are familiar with any of these vendors, feel free if you'd like to at the end, um, you know, share some of your experiences. A refresher on nematodes. There are multiple species of nematodes that target the larval stages of our greenhouse pests, fungus gnats, and shorefly, and then grubs that occur in perennial and nursery operations. Typically, nematodes are applied as a drench or require a film of water to be applied into the media and move around. Well, the BioB Corporation has introduced the NEMA Plus Depot P encapsulated nematodes. This patented technology comes from eNEMA and CATS Biotech. The encapsulated capsule is very small, about four millimeters or a fifteenth of an inch. It's a liquid core filled with nematodes. It's an oil water emulsion. The outer hydrogel is very porous gel, and it's made up of water, some sunflower oil, some calcium chloride, um, an emulsifier, and then a sodium alginate product, which is a natural brown seaweed. So how does this work? Well, you simply incorporate it into the substrate preventatively. The outer coat will dissolve and release the nematodes. Those infective juveniles will target out the pest larva. So growers can use this whether they're doing peat media or coconut cork. Comes in two package sizes, 320,000 and 50 million. They can store in the refrigerator for five to six weeks. The key is that the nematodes do need to be covered with media. They just cannot simply be broadcast over the top. Work them in about a quarter of an inch of the media and those nematodes will get all they need to start releasing into the soil. So sachets are not new for predatory mites, but the BioV innovation of Phytocelis persimilis in a sachet has been a game changer. Like our Amylus Cs, Cucumeris, and Sorsky sachets, they reproduce within the sachet and then they'll leave over a period of time depending on which sachet you chose. The BioPercy Speed delivers in three to five days, while the Classic sachet delivers in 10 to 12 days. Inside each sachet, it's going to contain some food, some eggs, immature, and adults. Now, the BioPercy Plus is reared on a different food source. So when they come out, they are first white in appearance, but as soon as they start feeding, they change that red color, and that's going to indicate one that's successful feeding. Percy Plus is a very robust predator. It has improved egg laying, it improved seeking of prey, and it's really great for hot spot control areas. From BioLine AgroSciences, these dispensers and carts are invaluable for any grower that battles caterpillar larvae. The trypograma are egg parasites of our leptodopterum pests. Thinking of the crops you can use these in, hemp, cannabis, leafy greens, or cold crops, tomatoes, and anything really that is outdoor and field where caterpillars are highest. You always want to begin again to release these products before the caterpillar emerges. We have two species available, Trichogramma brassicaceae for egg masses that are greater than 30, like our European corn and then Trichogramma 
press the ultimate, which is for single or egg laid in less than five, like our corn earworm. There is, uh, within these capsules and cards, there are four waves. That fourth wave is an ultra delayed wave, and it's created by parasitizing the food that's inside the Zesty eggs. Whether you're using the cards or the capsules, the rate's about 40 dispensers per acre every two weeks. So these trichogramma products are based off accumulated growing degree days. So they're going to need a minimum temperature of at least 52 or higher to start to emerge from the egg into the adult. So they are usually uh, stored and shipped at 50 degrees. They can be held if you don't need them right away at 50 degrees. And they're very easy to use. The pheromone uh, balls, just go ahead and uh, toss them out. And you can um, also use drones. And the cards are pretty much just hung into the crop canopy. And you um, snap the card, and that activates them. So anybody who's doing white flight knows that a successful program is going to involve our two parasitic plots, Arabosaurus and Encarcia. Encarcia is generally used with greenhouse white fly, while Aramosaurus will do both species. So these balls that are developed from BioB are very unique. It's going to save a lot of labor from the cards because they simply can be um, tossed out or hung onto a string. They're completely compostable, too. Um, it's a pretty much one-to-one -one replacement for the eggs on a card. And you want to just make sure, you know, ordering them um, uh, in Carcia one week in advance. And if you're looking for the air monsters, they do need two weeks in advance. In the crops that you're usually going to use these on are poinsettias, tomatoes, and cucurbits. So the bug line highway, what is that all about? I'm going to I have a little video here that I'm going to have running in the background so you can see. So its sachets provide uh, release over four to six weeks and usually one sachet for five square feet. Well, the bug line is a long ribbon of sachets tied together. And in, inside again, it contains your um, mites, your um, feeding material, feeder fungi, and depending on which sachet you pack, Amblyseus cucumerus, um, one in three sachets are filled with mites. Um, they, come in six rolls in a package, and they come in various lengths. And then Amblyseus sorskii, one in six sachets, are filled with um, the mite. And it comes in, again, six rolls per case, and only one length there. These are really great for anybody who has benching systems that where their crops are pretty even and low growing. You can use them on potted plants, house plants, strawberries, um, cannabis growers use them on trellis systems. There's just a lot of different areas that you could rethink in, about using these. So we know that sticky roller tapes improve monitoring and um, control of our flying insects. The trap line T is specific for mass trapping of our thrips, the western flower thrips in particular. It is designed by BioLine and it's a micro encapsulated pheromone that's actually incorporated inside the glue on these sticky tape. The, the color matrix and the pattern offers a three dimensional effect that has been found to be very attractive. The glue is very stable. It has to be at least 50 degrees in order to be activated, but it actually stays active up to 185 degrees. Now, we might not have any thrips in our greenhouse at 185, but that glue is still hanging in there. These traps, you know, have been proven to be very effective to help reduce pesticide applications, and it doesn't interfere with any kind of other, you know, pollinator or predator in general. They're not attracted to the pheromone. And Research studies have shown, particularly over in Europe, that really uses a lot of this, that by itself, it reduces 25% of thrips in, in your crop. But if you also combine using the Amblyseus um, predatory mite with the sticky rolls, you can actually get thrips down to anywhere from 53 to 87%. That's, that's quite a bit of uh, reduction there. The tape does last up to five weeks, and if it's not really, you know, heavily uh, mass, you know, with insects, you can just add and put additional trip line lures on it to give it a little bit extra boost. 
So when these roller tapes first came out, I was involved in some trials down in Maryland here at Catoctin Mountain Growers and Greenway Farms. I don't think I have to tell anybody in the audience what, you know, it's like the stickiness on sticky cards, but this tape is uh, extremely uh, even more messy. I didn't know about these sticky clips that came um, at that, that time from BioVest now being offered through beneficial and sector. Well, I'm telling you, these clips are a sticky tape liberator. They're very, very easy to use. It comes with some plastic um, uh, ties that you put in the top and the bottom of the clip, and you adhere them to the secure pole or wherever you're going to mount these. Um, then the, the top of the clip kind of just opens down, and you would put the beginning of the sticky roll in there and then close it back up and just press it firmly to, to secure it, and then you begin to stretch out your tape. There's 150 of these clips in a bag, um, just a, a time saver, I'm telling you. And you can reuse these. Um, of course, you always want to sanitize whenever you reuse any kind of tool in the greenhouse. So along with the thrips pheromone for Western flower thrips, which are both available from um, Beneficial Insector and BioLine, you can use um, Another lure out there for the European pepper moth. If you haven't experienced this, you're lucky. Because it's really a potentially, you know, damaging crop um, to not only ornamentals, but edible crops. In the south, it has seven, eight generations a year. The larvae bore into the lower part of the stems. They hide in dirt and the grass that they produce. Um, very hard to get to with chemical sprays. So these lures um, help uh, track out the males. Okay, so whenever there's males, you know that there are females um, not far behind. Usually you put about one um, trap out per 10,000 square feet. If it's a high pressure, you might go to one per 5,000 square feet. Hang them um, 10, uh, 12 to 20 inches above the crop. And, um, you know, replace them at six-week intervals, maybe three, if, again, if you have high pressure. You can store the, the lures in the freezer uh, for a year. And they last one year in the fridge um, and two years unopened. You do need to um, either apply these to sticky cords or you can purchase the Delta traps to put the firm on the lure on. So on to some labor-saving devices. So many of our customers have tried and are using this modified leaf blower to distribute our predatory mites and Chrysopola eggs. We have a really good tech sheet on it. Give us a call, um, get it out to you if, if you're interested. We know that it's electric, not gas. We always use vermiculite carriers because bran will clump and clog the funnel. Um, you can anticipate about a 15 foot spread from it so it's easy you can walk down one side of the bench and up the other and get that whole bench um you know covered there and, and it really as fast as you can walk um and research has shown that um it doesn't damage mites uh, it speeds of 67 to 100 miles per hour are not damaging to mites so the bio b has produced a you know I think advanced version of the modified leaf blower, and it uses a Makita blower to attach to this bug line unit. It is available for growers who want to trial this for two weeks before they actually have to make an investment in it. What a great deal is that? Um, you do need to be a BioB customer, okay? Um, so you want to work through BioB and Griffin. So the Unit is unique in that it comes with a lot of adjustable settings, but most of our growers are going to find that settings one and two are, you know, probably appropriate for most of our bios. Um, the manual that it comes with really has some valuable guidelines for implementing and the rate applications based on the volume um, and then your um, speed um, time. So again, when it comes to specific calibration and adjustments, you know, let's talk with bio and get them involved in this. So Beneficial Insectary offers now the BioVest applicator for growers who want to use the supplemental food nutrient. And Karen's going to touch on that a little bit later in detail. 
So it's it's pretty much a sprayer attachment again to this Makita blower. It holds about 500 grams, but typically you don't fill it all the whole thing up. You use only about 300. It blows at about 45 feet distance and about a 11 and a half foot width. So it's only going to take six to 10 minutes to actually completely disperse um, that reservoir. Um, being that it is a pollen, you are going to want to make sure that you protect yourself with a dust mask and some eye protection. There are growers that actually use other bios through it with carriers such as vermiculite and sawdust. You do not want to exceed the number two setting on this. So for growers that are not interested in blower equipment, um, you can consider the use of a handheld fertilizer spreader, like this kind of spreader. Very, very easy to uh, pick up. Um, like your blowers, you're going to want to use products that are with a vermiculite carrier. Okay. And the growers need to, you know, practice a little bit, get their walking speed down to see exactly, you know, how far it's going to go. Um, Pretty, pretty easy to use. Um, you're going to you know, make sure your VCA is alive. You're going to put it in. You probably add some additional vermiculite, some kind of carrier um, to help, you know, distribute the, the uh, uh, mites or chrysopla eggs. Okay. And then you're going to, you know, sit out and, and hold that spreader just about one or two feet over the crop and, you know, start walking. Um, and again, you're going to have to experiment. You know, with the opening, how much opening you want it, depends on your walking speed, you know, how far it actually is spreading. So release cups. These are available, really, for growers who might not want to deal with sachets. Um, they're available from all three of our vendors, BI, BioLine, and BioB. The choice of the BCA is up to you. Usually it's predatory mites and chrysobola eggs. It could be parasitized pupa as well. You simply hang the, the cups out like you would a sachet, not in direct sun, in the canopy, one per five to ten square feet. Um, you want to put one or two teaspoons in each cup. Be, you know, you're out there scouting each week. You need to be checking to see if you need to, to uh, replace it. Um, the benefit of the cup is much like a sachet. I mean, it's going to increase the humidity within that cup, reducing the dehy dehydration. And that's really the number one, you know. Um, thing that kills our predatory mites is they get dehydrated. And they're um, compostable. They're, you know, cardboard, so very easy. Um, if, um, you need to um, take them down and replace them. You can simply put them in the compost. So I'm going to switch gear and talk about some of the concepts for strategic planning. So no matter what strategy is chosen, but, you know, the very first step in starting a BCA program is you want to start when the pests are either non-existent or at a very low pressure. You want to hope that your supplier is sending you some clean plants. And then, you know, we strongly encourage growers to do any kind of dip or spray to ensure they are free before you actually start putting them out into your production area. How do you know if your plants are clean? Scouting. Scouting is, you know, really, you know, just so critical to a successful and to the economics of your BCA program. So let's take some time to talk about our generalists in a biocontrol program. So if you use traditional chemistry to kill your pest, in order to select the right chemistry, you need to ID the pest and make sure that that product kills it. So VCAs are... are not much different in that they are specific and only will kill certain pests. So they're going to either be classified as a generalist predator, which is generally less picky, or a parasitoid, which is more specific. The predator eats an insect and feeds on it, while the parasitoid develops inside the, the pest and kills it. So both of them are going to be enemies of the pest. Most generalist predators are a little bit more active, they're stronger, and they control more than one pest. Your parasitoids are going to be smaller, they're very determined, and but usually, you know, kill the pest a little bit slower than a um, generalist. You do need to be careful, though, about parasitoids because they can actually become parasitized by another parasitoid. If you ever use banker plant and you've had your banker plant program crash, notice, and that is because of a hyperparasite. 
So when you, whenever you overlap generalists in a BCO program, you do need to realize that they may actually feed on some other prey, and lace wings are a good example of that. So I wanted just to put this slide in here, You're going to be in your handout, you know, to look at later. But this is just highlight some of the predatory uh, general is that we offer predatory mites, you got the string of lilac, soil dwelling mite, you have um, Chrysopola, Adalia, ladybird beetles, Aureus, and Delosia. Um, one of the things, you know, you should never just rely on one BCA uh, species for a pest problem. Um, so let's take a look at what could be a better approach. So layering a generalist to back up your primary BCA control. So here are just a few examples of BCAs that are not your first line defense to back up, as I mentioned, as a primary control agent. ACEs are usually controlled by aphidias, our first choice, but overall the pressure um, can be increased if you add in lace wing. And aureus is used for thrips. When we know that it's great for the adult stages where the, where the predatory mites do not touch. And then adding in some delosia or atheta to help feed on the pupa in the soil, just like nematodes, you know, will do, um, is great. It, it helps break up that life cycle. So some different ways you can layer. In this research study, they compared aphid controls with aphid predators, in particular the Colmani against some of the other um, biologicals, the Chrysopola, the lacewing larva, the Adalia ladybug, you know, they are both generalists. So enclosed on, they, what they did is they took aphids, they enclosed them on plant stems, they put 60 aphids plus a single predator. And you see no BCAs in 12 days on the aphid counts were 815. The chrysopa alone, the aphids were at 425. Now, the Aphidius colmani, a parasitic wasp, does a pretty good job of down to 137 alive. But look what happens when you combine that with the lacewing, down to 86. And then if you add in Adalias, you actually get down to 78. Now, in this study, they also did Adalia by itself, um, and it only reduced aphids to 270. But when, again, they added in the uh, the lace wing, it brings it down even further. So, you know, the bring home of this whole slide is that the more layering of generalists that you can do, particularly for hard to control pests, the better that your program will be. So we just looked at some layering BCAs for aphids. So aphids are one of our hardest pests to control. So you could choose a different method, a hybrid strategy. Chemicals for when the aphids are needed while using BCAs for things like thrips and spider mites. And then you can add in some of the Chrysopola larvae um, as needed to help reduce the number of sprays for these aphids. Think about your pest problems this past spring. And if you're a BCA user, you might consider this approach and try it next spring. We are always happy to help. So here's an example for the spider mite hybrid strategy. Again, begin with sprays or dips, eliminate or reduce as much as you can spider mite eggs early in production. And if you find yourself in a jam and you're comfortable using compatible products, okay, that way you don't have to reset the whole program and you won't crash it. Um, the, the products listed on this slide here are very compatible. And then you can see um, even that some of the um, products are going to have some edible crops on the label, which we know we have a lot of, you know, edible crop growers, and some of them are even bio-insecticide. So you just want to make sure that you time your sprays in advance with your BCA orders. It's a really good strategy to be able to work in to your program. The BioB shared this general idea that they use in ornamentals, and it's known as the 80-20 strategy. The idea is very similar to growers that make pesticide applications trying to kill all your pests with which is one pesticide. So why not spin this and use it on your BCA program where 80% of your crop is only on one program and then you're going to have some occasional um, times, maybe 20% of your crops might have to have some additional help in 
at a different program. Um, it's not complex. It's a very realistic approach. If you want to do your entire facility and set just a little bit here, a little bit there with some DCAs. Most of the program relies on a blower system, and I mentioned quite a few good ones in my previous slide. So let's just take a closer look at how you could work this. So the vision of the 80-20 and some of the guidelines is that a little bit here, a little bit there, how do we pull it all together? Well, 80% of your crops should be on one program. So say I have fruits and mites or going to be my big pest and I got a half an acre greenhouse. So my base mixture here is going to be this example is Horsky with Artemia, some chrysopla eggs, some Ambassies Californicus, and some additional um, vermiculite. And I'm going to put these through the blower and I'm going to be spraying 80% of my crops. And then if I need, I'm going to add in some additional, you know, say aureus for the additional trips that get on my garbers. And say I got mealybugs that show up on some of my, you know, tropical house plants. And, and then I get spider mites, more spider mites on my um, Dracaena spikes. I add in these additional pests, okay? They don't have to be added in every week either. It's just on those crops that, that the pressure starts to get high. So you keep good records, right? You know what your crops are. You know, this is just an example. It can be tailored specifically for your operation. Uh, you can even do this with Swirsky sachets and then add in some Stradiolalabs and Persimilis or Polani and Irvi. Just remember, your program is going to be individual. This is not a one-fit program for you. Feel free to reach out to Karen, I, and anyone in the GGS Pro team. We're happy to help you um, with your biological programs. And I'm going to pass on to Karen. Thanks for that, Joanne. No matter what you do for a strategy, you need your BCAs to be alive and thriving to get good results, obviously. So in this section, I want to talk about getting the most out of your money by providing the conditions that your BCAs really need. BCA suppliers have quality insurance programs in all of their processes, and including shipping. They look at where the package is going and determine whether it needs ice packs or not. Some BCAs need ice packs in every shipment. A few of them do not. Some of the mites don't need ice packs depending on the conditions. Also, when the packages are, are packed, it's important that the uh, mites can breathe, that they don't have heat and CO2 buildup from sachets where they have food going on and they're breeding colonies in there. You don't want buildup of CO2, and also you don't want that temperature contrast between the heat and the ice that can cause condensation. That'll wet the bran that's shipped with the mites and cause further problems. So despite the best planning, things do go wrong in transit. It's a good idea to have an inexpensive infrared thermometer that you can test the temperature of your products when they come in. You can use that for a lot of different things, plants as well and plants on your tables. Um, if you do think something's wrong with the shipment, claims need to be made really quickly. 48 to 24 hours, send a copy of the packing slip uh, to GGS Pro or to your salesperson, along with any pictures, if you can take pictures of the shipment and what you see that's wrong with it, um, do that to support your claim. Have a, a normal procedure to check the BCAs when they come in, not only for the temperature, to make sure that they are alive. We need to put them, once they arrive, in the right conditions also to maintain them, unless you're going to release them right away into your crop. And one thing that I like to call out is that humidity is one of the main uh, killers of our predatory mites. Too low of humidity, which could happen in a office or a box. So when those mites come in, if you're not using them immediately, uh, put them in a humid location like the greenhouse out of the sun in the shade. GGS Pro has a bulletin listing all the storage temperatures, time limitations, 
and the holding conditions for BCAs and a few other notes. So just request this bulletin and we'll be happy to send it to you. Also, a second resource is this quality control booklet by Rose Bootenhaus at Violin Research Institute in Canada. She published this great guide quite a few years ago now, detailing all of the methods for quality assurance of your BCAs when they come in. This guide has great pictures, uh, pages for each BCA with detailed descriptions about how to check the quality of them. Uh, it's such a great resource, resource that the University of Florida keeps it posted on their websites. So between these documents, I think you have everything you need to handle your BCAs when they come in. But storage conditions are not working conditions for our bugs and our mites. So this slide and the next slide list critical factors in your production area that the BCAs need. In short day length conditions, several of our common BCAs can undergo diapause, meaning that they basically go into a type of hibernation where they barely feed and they don't reproduce. So there are definitely conditions to avoid <laughs> for your BCAs to get good activity. They have temperature ranges that they work best at, and particularly when you're choosing the mites, that can be a consideration of which of the predatory mites you're choosing for spider mites or for thrips, and you see those conditions listed here. Aureus is one of the main insects that undergoes diapause that we use quite a bit in the greenhouse. Just looking down the chart though at the temperature ranges, you see that hardly anything works above 95 degrees in the greenhouse. Uh, people don't like to work in those conditions either. The bugs also have humidity ranges that they require. And for most everything on this part of the chart, uh, that is above 50% humidity for the activity and reproduction of those insects. Beyond those environmental conditions, we can support our BCA populations with banker plants or companion plants. These plants can supply prey, sources of pollen or nectar, or just a habitat for living. I'm not going to discuss bankers in any detail today, but you can request more information from GGS Pro. Uh, whenever you're ready to bump your program up a notch and try some bankers or support plant. It is interesting, Florida recently published an insight into producing new banker plant systems and all the research they were done. That was published in Grower Talks. And the thought process about nurturing these insects along is something that I think everyone using BCAs could benefit from reading. Providing extra outside food is another uh, way that we can nurture our BCAs. This can really help us build up a population. The first supplemental food that I'm going to talk about is the Artemia but from BioBee. Artemia is brine shrimp cyst. It comes in a bulk pack shown here, a bottle, a shaker bottle. It also comes in this roll, the BioArt Feed tape. This tape has the Artemia glued to both edges of it, and you can simply roll it out along the bench. You can use it to wrap support and make feeding stations. This is a, a nice format for the feed. It also, Artemia could trigger allergy sensitivities in people with um, allergies to seafood. So by using the tape, it keeps the Artemia off of, off of the plant, so that would not be an issue. When you feed Artemia, it's been shown that it can reduce the number of Swirsky applications, extend the interval from one to two weeks to two to three weeks, which is a significant cost savings if you can do that and keep your population up. Swirsky especially responds very well to that. Cucumerus does not respond as well. And Aureus is also responds very well to the Artemia, but Aureus actually will prefer the Abessia eggs. However, the Artemia will last when you put it out in the greenhouse depending on the humidity, but up to as much as six to eight weeks, where with the Abestia, we eggs would have to put them out weekly. The Artemia in the refrigerator lasts indefinitely, essentially, and it doesn't require freezing. 
So the rates we'll talk about a little bit later for all of these foods. So I'm gonna move on to the Ephestia eggs. These are um, a moth egg. They provide extra protein and provide sustenance for Aureus, Dicyphus, and Chrysoperla. Their trade names are listed here, Buggy and Nutriforce. These uh, eggs are mixed with carrier and can sprinkle them directly onto your crops. Another way to apply them shown here on the bottom is to sprinkle them onto the sticky part of a post-it note and then just layer or hang that post-it note in the crop. For the Ephestia eggs, we do need to keep them refrigerated or frozen, one or the other. If you're not going to use them within a week, they should be, should be frozen. Our next food is Nutramite. It's a, a food strictly for predatory mites. Nutramite is type of pollen. Um, you can spread it or sprinkle it in the crops. In fact, we saw earlier with Joanne, the um, beneficial insectary blower for blowing out the Nutramite on your crops. It works well to mix it with cornstarch if you're trying to distribute it over a very large area. Because let's face it, you don't want to um, overload them with food. Uh, you want your BCAs, you want to support them, but you want them to be out hunting as well. Nutramite has an unlimited shelf life at, in the freezer and about a two week shelf life in the refrigerator. So defrost that in refrigerated space and don't refreeze it. Another food for mites is this BioCL that's new from BioBee. It is a basically a freeze dried fruit mite. It's an alternate source for predatory mites. Typically throughout the season, they recommend release, uh, putting it out when you release your BCAs. And then again, whenever the prey densities are low, the BioCL can improve uh, reproduction and it only needs to be stored in cool temperatures and in the dark. It doesn't need to be frozen. Weast is our last food that I'm going to talk about. This is from Beneficial Insectary. It is an artificial diet specifically to support the lacewing larvae. What you do with the weast is mix it up to a consistency of peanut butter with some water and paint that paste onto some kind of support that the life, the larvae can come feed at. So basically make feeding stations with it. You can dilute it down more and spray it on to the supports as well, but you don't want to spray it across the uh, entire crop. Once you mix up that paste, it lasts for five days, up to five days in the refrigerator. So this chart is supplied just for your handout. It lists all the foods, uh, the BCAs that it feeds, what the nature of that food is, how often to reply, reapply, how much to apply to start with, and gives you some idea of the sizes of packages available and an idea of the price here. So that's really just for your future planning more than uh, anything else. It'll be in your handout. Now I want to look at the economic impact of some of the options we've discussed and we'll look at three different cases here. In the first case, feeding Artemia, the brine shrimp cyst, to Aureus to build up their population. These experiments were done at actually three locations. I'm going to show data from two different locations here. This is published work. I can provide the reference for you if you're interested. This is published by the, by the people at BioB. What they did was in a greenhouse, uh, greenhouse sweet pepper production at transplant put in aureus or shortly after transplant aureus into one greenhouse and fed them with the artemia the other greenhouse the there was no feed with the aureus releases they charted the population of the aureus in blue with feed and without feed in red and also the thrips without feed in red and with feed in the blue line shown in each graph. So that was just an introduction. Next we will look at when they actually um, made their aureus releases. We can see that the purple areas indicate the artemia feeding um, and the green areas indicate the artemia release. Now in each greenhouse 
the Aureus releases were the same. The only difference was the Artemia feed in one house. The releases are shown there. We can see the final graphs, but there was just one more step that affects these final graphs. So let's bring that in. And that is that the green is the original planned Aureus releases, but in the houses with no feed, they had to add extra Aureus releases. So the red lines are affected by these extra three Aureus releases shown in the gold or yellow color. The results show that with the Artemia feeding, the blue line, the Aureus population jumps up very quickly and then uh, stabilizes at near 100% of the flowers having an Aureus population. Eventually, with the extra releases that were made into the houses with no feed, they got to a probably 20, 30, 40% lower amount of Aureus in those houses. If we look at the thrips with no feed, we see the red line, the thrips population here at 30 or 40% of the flowers have thrips in them or the plants. Sorry, they didn't just look at the flowers. They did look at the whole plant as well as the flowers. So we have 30, 40% uh, percent of our plants have thrips, and you see that that population is going up and down. With the Artemia feed, the thrips population is there, but it's fairly stable and very low, maybe 5% as opposed to 30 or 40 up here with no Artemia feed. At our second location, again, they had to do three extra releases of the Aureus to, in order to bring their population up. Um, even without those extra, well, there were no extra releases in the houses represented by this blue line. And we see that with these two feedings, the Aureus population jumped up right away and then stabilized. No extra Aureus added. However, to, um, in the no-feed house, to get the level of aureus in their plants, again, these three extra uh, applications or releases of aureus. If we look at the thrips population, we see that with no artemia, a few weeks in, about five weeks, our thrips population starts to just explode there. In the artemia house, we see an increase, but it is, is much less and uh, moderated. So you can see that their last release of Aureus in this no feed house uh, was right at the high point of the thrips. So they, with the extra releases, they were able to get this, their thrips population down um, where it was comparable, I would say, to their other house. But what are the economics of this? Let's look. Let's look at that now. At Farm 1, when Artemia was applied, they released 1,400 Aureus. Um, with no feed, they ended up doubling that amount. So the reduction in the applied Aureus was $1,400. At a round number of $50, cost, $50 per thousand, their savings on Aureus was $70, and the Artemia cost them less than a dollar. On Farm 2, where they uh, originally started with 3,900 Aureus, more or less, they ended up almost releasing 7,000 there. The reduction with the Artemia and the number of Aureus that they required was 2,880, shown here. At $50 a thousand, they saved $144 on the cost of their Aureus, and that's not even to mention the labor. Again, the Artemia cost just over a dollar, um, so $143 savings in this case. Switching gears completely to another economic analysis, I want you to consider the type of predatory mites that will work best in your greenhouse or for your production, and consider alternate application methods really here. We're gonna look at the economics of it. So the bulk mites shown in the container can be sprinkled, blown, or broadcast. We looked at that equipment or released using release boxes. So there are options uh, how to put those out. We also 
The other method of putting mites out would be the sachet method. They come on sticks or with hooks. We're showing a stick here. And then it hasn't been quite so common, but the bug line is a really economical way to put out uh, sachets for a larger production area. So I want to look at the cost differences in applying these three different methods. And we're going to do that by looking at three different sizes of production area. So on the left, you see our production area, 3,000 square feet, 10,000, or an acre at 43,560 here. With the bulk mites, we are putting them out weekly. And for the labor estimates, I've tried to make a fair estimate of the labor. For bulk mites, I'm planning on using that rotary spreader. That it will be pretty quick, as fast as you can walk and work out the timing to get your uh, right amount of BCAs out. So once that's worked out, it goes very fast. For the sachets, we use stick sachets. Uh, not placing them on the line that figured the label for going back into the crop after it's laid down and placing those sachets. And then for our largest uh, location, the one acre, I've only calculated the bug line shown here. What we see is that for across the board, the sachets for six weeks, if you're making weekly applications, no matter the size of the location, the sachets will come out cheaper, more cheaply on a, a six week basis because the sachets last for six weeks. So you're only going into the crop once during that time for the purpose of putting out your BCAs, unlike bulk where you would be doing it weekly. The same would be true for the bug line. You would replace that for ornamentals once every six weeks for food crops, probably more often. For our, for our small house, then the our 3,000 square foot, the cheapest uh, method came out to be the sachets. The same is true for 10,000 square feet. And for our one acre, the bug line in the cost of uh, estimated fell in between the bulk and the sachets. But I would say that it is priceless to spend two hours uh, compared to most of a day. Priceless to have someone have three quarters of their day available to work on something else. So these are the kind of cost comparisons that you can do and think about your production and what will be most economical. If you are covering a large area that the bug line can be really um, the way to go. I talked to you about is literally the number one way you can make your BCA program better, and that is to do a cleanup step on your incoming plants. There, these are theoretical numbers listed here about how insects can explode. If we just think about the number of eggs or the young uh, insects that a single female can produce, <clears throat> we see that these numbers can build up to the hundreds of thousands really quickly. Luckily in our greenhouses, the conditions aren't perfect like this assumes, and we have uh, some natural enemies that will put some limits on these numbers. But the point is that just a single insect or mite with its innate ability to reproduce can cost you considerable time and money. The unrooted cuttings can be dipped. I often hear growers say that they can't take the time to do that, but I would encourage every grower, especially those using BCAs, to find a way to clean up their incoming plants. We can spray dipping um, rooted cuttings or pl uh, seed plugs is really a messy operation. It works and people do do that, but uh, a couple of rounds of spray can really help as well. No matter what you choose, I would encourage you to do something to clean up all incoming plants. Now I want to look at a real case of what one insect can do. This was part of a much larger experiment, but I just pulled out one part of it where they inoculated a greenhouse with the equivalent of either one or five thrips per plant. These are on cucumber plants. 
uh, one or five thrips per plant in average over the greenhouse, and then they track their population of the immature thrips here in black and the adult thrips in white um, across the time. So their end point is at 49 days here, or uh, a data collection point for them at 49 days that I picked up here. If they inoculated on the bottom, uh, an average of one adult per plant, after, after 49 days, they saw a total of about 140 uh, thrips per plant, per plant. A few thrips can destroy a plant's uh, saleability, um, but 149 per plant is not, never going to be an acceptable uh, plant. If they released five, day, uh, five thrips per plant after 49 days, they have over 500 thrips per plant now if they've done nothing to control those thrips. So that's a real life situation. Seven weeks, 49 days, that's the production cycle of many of your crops. You know what that means? Economic ruin at 49 days if you uh, haven't done anything about those pest populations. So this is our basic preventative plan here. We're putting out Aphidius colmane for um, aphids every two weeks, increasing the amount with a different package size as we get later in the season and aphids tend to um, pick up. And then yet later in the season, we're changing to a different product with Aphidius colmane and Aphidius ervi uh, mixed that will cover more aphid species. We're also backing our Aphidius wasp up with the lacewing larvae every other week. So this is schedule is preventative every two weeks. For the aphids, thrips we're using sachets every six weeks. Um, when it gets warmer in the season, we're switching here to the Swirsky. We're also backing that up with our uh, the sachets with the Steiner Nema feltii nematodes drenched into the soil. That'll get the three thrips pupae and prepupal stages in the soil. So that's our, our uh, preventative plan to start. It's going to cost right around $2,500. But as would be normal, we detect some aphids at some point and also some thrips a little later in this example. So let's look at the cost effects of those discoveries. So here we have our updated plan. Once we detected aphids, we moved to weekly releases of the aphidius colmani. Based on um, the populations, the numbers were, are, are increased quite a bit. Once we get a little bit of control, maybe those could be reduced back down, the number of aphidias you're putting in the houses. We're still going to use the Colmane and Irvi mix when it gets later in the season, but now I'm planning to use double the amount that I was planning on. The Chrysopa eggs are our backup. We're keeping those at a release once every two weeks. For the thrips, we're still doing the sachets, but what we've added are some bulk Swirsky applications. Once thrips were found, our sachets are still in force. They're just not enough mites to get it done. Let's bolster them up with some extra Swirsky in bulk releases. And also to help control those uh, pupae in the soil, one extra release of nematodes that we didn't actually plan. This is a fairly realistic situation. We now see our cost went up to almost $4,300. That is a 70% increase in our price. That is the cost of bringing insects into your greenhouse. It really is important to try to start clean when you're using a BCA program. Well, in summary, biological control is a fluid process. There is not one set recipe. Everything that you do in your production makes your situation somewhat unique. So a goal of Joanne and I here was to provide you information to consider tailoring your biological control program to your needs and to get the most economy out of it. 
That could be new packaging or release methods, or it could be a, a change in strategy to decide to control aphids chemically and thrips and mites where we have less effective chemicals to control those by BCAs. We want to support our BCAs all the way along. We've provided you plenty of information to help do that, I believe. Just a couple other points I'd like to make is your experience with your BCA program completely matters if that hasn't been emphasized here. But I will say that often you can cut the cost of your plan after you get some experience. When we don't know at the start, we're more likely to throw extra BCAs at the problem to make sure we are successful. And that can be trimmed sometimes. There will be a lot of trial and error in the program. Define what is success for you and shoot for it when you're using your BCA program. Thank you very much for your attention today.